Hi everyone, it's Norman Kochnick here from Eyes on Cricket with Norman Kochnick. It's an unusual time. It's what, 5 p.m. here in Australia. It is some 11.30 a.m. in India. And in America, I'll find out more from Pretty in a minute. I believe it's about 10 p.m. yesterday. I never can work that out. It's always beyond me. Uh, but it's always exciting. And I love engaging. Well, we had, we were meant to have last night, everyone, we were meant to have Mervyn Richards from Antigua. And you wouldn't believe the story. Both Mervyn and I fell asleep. And we didn't make our time slot. That's how hilarious that is. That was, that was a classic. But I'm here today and I'm very excited. A lovely young lady called Preeti Upala. She's actually uh, currently in Los Angeles, or at least in California, I should be more specific. Um, and she has an amazing uh, bio on an amazing array of topics, has a great deal of um, interest, obviously has an Indian heritage, but has lived in Australia and Sydney, I believe. We'll find out more about that. Is now living in America. Um, let me welcome right up front, Preeti Upala. Welcome to the show. Namaste, Norman, and namaste, namaste to your wonderful audience. Namaskar, everyone. I'm so honored to be part of your amazing show. I've enjoyed watching your amazing reporting of this great test uh, series that we just had. Really brilliant. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a pleasure for me to have you on the channel in particular. And we'll go into a, a lot of topics today. But one of the biggest things for me, and I think most audiences still don't realize, when I look at the demographics of the world in terms of cricket, India is always number one, purely one and a half billion or whatever number we've got in India. They're cricket mad as much as what we are in Australia, but sheer weight of numbers puts them at number one. But I, I always ask the average person, and I'm talking about Australians, whomever, who is second? And they, they say to me, Pakistan, Bangladesh, maybe Sri Lanka, Australia, England, all the obvious places you would think of, South Africa. They always, when I say it's actually the USA, they go, huh, how could that be possible? I said, well, it is. And they go, but then they don't even know what cricket is all about. Well, well, actually they do because they've got such a diversity of population from Indians right through to West Indians. And that's two gamuts of people. On the East Coast, you go to Miami, it is full of ex-cricketers. And I'll go through a story later. I've, I've got some amazing stories about the way I've sort of clamoured over people and met people by accident in the, in the world who were huge cricketing people, and, but it's just amazing. But, but America to me is very special because I've been, I've been very fortunate to be 20 or 30 times to America, often to New York. I've got a great friend of mine who I'm going to get you to meet pretty. He is the funniest guy. His name is Jim Farbanek. He's based in Orange County. If anyone can make you laugh, he can make you laugh. And he actually never played cricket before. We came to Australia, went out in the field and took a magnificent catch a gully and he became an instant cricketer so we'll get this there's, there's so much i can talk about i've got to try and pair back and start from the beginning and to me the most important thing for me to find out because i think my viewers know about me probably too much actually um, <laughs> is we need to find out about you i'd love to hear from your own voice all about you oh thank you norman again what a pleasure to be on your on your show for me, my journey has been quite um, magical. I was born in Dubai, of all places, so Middle East, grew up there all around, and then moved to Europe briefly before my family immigrated to Sydney, Australia, many years ago. And they still live there, and I'm very proud Australian. Um, but I, I went to school in Sydney. I um, have a, a degree. I worked as an investment banker there until I chucked it all uh, because I knew that it wasn't my dharma in life. It wasn't my purpose. So I realized that I wanted to do something creative and artistic and use my voice and my my creative uh, uh, you know, expressions. And I wanted to be on the global stage. So I think it became very clear, very, obvi uh, very obviously, very quickly that I should um, be on the global stage and specifically uh, in acting, entertainment, theater, drama, and so Hollywood came calling. I won a scholarship to uh, study in New York. And when that came through, I just realized that uh, this is a, you know, a new chapter in my life and uh, I'm never going to look back again. So I just I made that uh, that move, uh, bought a one way ticket from Sydney to um, LAX. And uh, the moment I sort of landed at LAX, it's been quite a magical ride. And I've been here for 10 years. So I still work in the industry. I act and I'm putting together a show. 
producing uh, a show, but I do so many other things. I have my own radio show. I speak around the world on various topics like spirituality, uh, empowerment, uh, you know, dharma, uh, cultural uh, sort of, well, culture, religion, uh, also politics and international affairs and things like that. I write for a bunch of outlets. I'm also writing my first book. Um, and I'm a Dharma ambassador as well. So I'm here to sort of, I, you know, life for me is all about, uh, you know, the truth and love and unity and all those wonderful things. Um, and I've traveled around the world. I've been to a hundred countries. It's my, my, truly my passion. And I just see myself as a global citizen doing, uh, trying to live my life's, uh, my life's purpose and, you know, be the best human being I can. And on the way, have adventures, have fun. And of course, a lot of cricket because I really am very obsessed. And I have been since I was very young. Uh, actually, I love sports altogether, but especially cricket. And I think moving here has made me even more interested in, uh, in cricket and sort of the global aspect of cricket. I'm almost looking at the geopolitical um, uh, effect of cricket not just for India, but for the world at large. And uh, on so many levels, we, you know, I think when on, on a cricket pitch, uh, somehow the religion and politics are put aside and people are just there for the game. And we can see this obviously when it's India, Pakistan, it's been like that for a long time now. So um, that's wonderful. It's really a unifying sport, I think, while most sports are quite divisive, I, I would say. So um, that's my journey, you know, in a nutshell. It's been one hell of a ride, and I think I'm just getting started. I think the new chapter of my life is is close. Uh, and post-COVID, I think uh, there's a lot that's going to open up for me. And I'm just, you know, uh, taking one step at a time and just going with the divine flow. I, I think that's wonderfully said. You resonated with me immediately when you said you'd been to 100 countries. I've been to 103. I have a great Ooh. love for travel as well. You beat and, me. <laughs> but, well, I'm a real bean counter. I, I have everything. I would you believe have a, this is my sound ridiculous, but I have a spreadsheet about everything I've ever done. I know, I know, how, many, I know how many flights I've been on. I know when they were, where they were. I have statistics coming out of my ears, probably because of my cricket love that have developed into this as well. So I have, this is a bit annoying for people to hear, but I'm gonna say it. My dear old mother has received a postcard from every place in the world that I've ever been and has, well, maybe one or two might be gone, have gone astray, but they've, she's got them and a lovely stack. I think it's well over a couple of thousand. And would you believe him even more um, ridiculously, they're actually numbered from one to over 2,000, so she has them all. And it's wow. basically my diary, and those cards have travelled the world. And it is so special to me. Obviously, one of the major places I go to and I love is the subcontinent, having been married to a lady from Sri Lanka. And India is my second. I have some of the most amazing friends there that the likes of Burin Majunda, who has written Tendulkar's book. I've known him for almost 12 odd years, but it feels like I've known him a lifetime. A guy who I'm going to be bringing on camera to who never goes on camera. He runs Extra Time, which is a major outlet in India. And, and he's Debash's Sen. I'm going to bring him on. He is a phenomenal man. He's met everybody too. And a guy called Kunsal Chakraborty, he actually is a presenter on ABP News. They're three of my little friendship that are just so important to me. So I, I have a love of India. I have a love of everyone in the world that has part Indian backgrounds, which intrigues me. Those from Fiji, from South Africa. And what I'm going to do, like yourself, is bring those communities together in the most positive way. And the leveler, of course, is cricket. Cricket's a great leveler. Everyone can talk about cricket. I'm always, rather stupidly, getting into a car, say it's a, an Uber or whatever, and if it's an Indian fellow or Sri Lankan or bank, my first question is, you must love cricket. And, <laughs> and, some, of them, and some of them say to me, no, I have nothing to do with cricket. And I'm, I'm in this deep shock state for about a minute thinking, what? But I have to understand, not everybody's going to be into cricket, but it's just so much fun. So, look, shouldn't start me talking. I, I'm going to, I think there's so many aspects, audience or viewers, we're going to deal with pretty on. Now, we're, I discussed a bit before, I'm going to get her to, to interview people in America that may never have heard of cricket or, or maybe cricket tragics. I want to see their reaction. 
the, the rawness of that reaction. Some people might go, what's that? And you might get a rather bizarre answer, but that's just half the fun of it. But some will know it back to front. They'll, you probably have a little 90-year-old lady that'll know it better than you and I put together. We just don't know. And that's my love of finding that out. And as well, there is so much cricket that goes on in America that people don't realise, or maybe they realise, which is a very high standard. There's a stadium in Florida called, it's actually in Fort Lauderdale, and it's now of an international level. And a, one of the one of the Crow brothers, Jeff Crow, who's alive, unfortunately his brother has passed away, who played for New Zealand, he has a lot to do with that venue. But in the state of Florida, in that area of Fort Lauderdale, Miami, you have a whole host of ex-cricketers, like the Lance Gibbs, who was a famous cricketer. You have um, people like uh, Brian Lara kind of floats in and out of there. There's um, Shunda Paul from the West Indies. There's a whole host of players that live in America that are probably very happy to be free. Tendulkar oh. and, and Tendulkar and um, Shane Warne brought a gaggle of great players to play in, on baseball stadiums. It was. Did you hear that? Did you see? They that? did. I heard that. I almost went to that game. Actually. Yeah, it was an incredible event. And it went really well, but unfortunately the impetus hasn't continued. But that was a magnificent eye-opener to people. The stadiums were quite full, obviously a lot of expats. But, yeah, America is the second biggest cricket audience in the world. And statistically, I'm seeing my stats through YouTube. They're just through the roof. A number of people are saying, I'm in California or wherever. And that's the beauty of this. It brings us all together. So, yeah, I, look, that's one of the... So tell me a bit about your impressions in America when you watched... Australia versus India and how that, especially the last day went of the test, or in fact, the overall feeling. What was your feelings when you saw that? Oh, so many feelings and emotions. Um, I don't think anybody expected it to be this spectacular uh, kind of game-changing, you know, match uh, for the ages uh, or series for the ages, I should say. Um, we unfortunately couldn't go to a sports bar here and watch it. Uh, so, you know, people were watching it at home on their computers, a a a as did I. And it wasn't like there was a watch party or anything, because unfortunately, California has be been the cesspool of Corona for a, a while. And uh, this was the worst lockdown that we that we had while this test was going on. So there wasn't much um, gathering of, of people. But I was just hooked on on uh, every ball. I think for me, uh, it was, uh, uh, you know, showing me a new India. And I think that this new India has been rising for um, a few years now. And I think it permeates through every fabric of Indian society, whether it's politics or technology or, uh, you know, academia, world leaders, speakers, authors, whatnot. But but definitely in sport and especially in cricket, because I think this team is uh, very proud um, to be Indian. I think Indians are, I've never seen them be proud of being Indian. And I think part of that is, I think if we have seen a new leadership in the country, a government that is very proud of being Indian. And I, that sort of ripples down to every citizen you know, every person on the street, whether in India or the diaspora outside. And for the first time ever, I think at least in my living history, they are proud to say that they're Indian. And also I think India, its place in the world has changed a lot in the past few decades. And I think it finds itself in a geopolitical sweet spot. And almost it's like got this chance to be the leader of the free world in so many ways, being the largest democracy, uh, being you know, uh, secular, diverse, uh, uh, plural, uh, all of those wonderful things. And also, you know, with the tech and uh, also post-COVID, I think nobody wants to see a world that's run by by China. And you look at what's going on in the U.S., it's the divided country that needs so much healing. And I just see an India that is really stepping up and wants to step up. And I think the whole world is waiting for it. And for me, this test match, the series was somehow a manifestation of that uh, yearning, of that desire to be something bigger on the global stage. And uh, when they, I mean, that, that draw was incredible, but the win at the end at the GABA was like, we can do this, you know, give us half a chance and we can do it because we have the talent and the passion and the ethics and the desire and the aspiration all we want is half a chance from the universe, from the world. And I feel like now 
not only is the world giving it to us, but I think we're claiming it in a way that we never have, to be honest, right? It's like we're unashamedly proud and, and uh, confident in ourselves. And I saw a team that um, kind of symbolized that. So I look at things uh, in a very different way than most people. I think most people are just watching a cricket match. I'm looking at it from a, either a spiritual perspective or some kind of geopolitical perspective. And I'm looking at this game that's being played, you know, uh, just globally. And I see this this match happening and what's going on. And I feel like it's a sort of a, 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 a like a slice of life of what's really going on in the world, the shift, the churn, sort of the paradigm shift in many ways. So for me, it was uh, very, very comforting, I think, uh, that it can be done and they've done it and the impossible has happened i think in many ways and I, i'm sure we'll talk about the underbelly of this test series which were so many very very deep um systemic issues whether it was racism or it was you know finally small time players getting a shot and i think australia looking at themselves maybe introspecting on how they've behaved um and uh, whether that's, is it going too far? Uh, is that good for the sport? And being overconfident maybe and so on. I think there's so many, uh, you know, there were, there, there was an underbelly, I think, to this test <clears throat> series that was sort of happening in parallel as the game was going on. And I sort of was looking at that as well. And it was all playing out, I think, like a beautiful Shakespeare tragedy uh, in, in some way. But um, it, I, it was very enjoyable, right? From every ball was enjoyable, especially that last GABA match was absolutely spectacular. Oh, look, I, I can't believe how well put that is. That is such an interesting way of looking at it. And, it's, and I, while you were talking, I was getting visions of things that happened to me throughout the series, moments in time. Like I spent the last overs with an incredibly interesting man who I interviewed shortly after. Darshak Mehta, who came from India, Australia, a very successful man, has taken on incredible foundations like the Chapel Foundation, the LBW Trust, which he knows literally everybody. He's so connected. He's such a, a with, with, with like a, a well kept man. He's incredibly intellectually, he, he knows character, he knows a person, he knows genuine, a genuine person. I was sitting on the lounge with him watching that particular part of the game, and I couldn't have thought of a better place. And, and the world's collided. Why was I there? I shouldn't have been. I should have been, at, you know, at a location taking the game in. But I chose to be there, and just the forces came. I was there. I was on his front um, balcony, which led to a view over Moston and Sydney, which you know, incredible view of the harbour, a uh, sprawling house. Everything was beautifully presented with Indian artefacts that you, I wouldn't even dream of seeing, like a museum. But he was such an incredible man, and we shared that moment together. And he and I said. We'll never forget this, and we've shared a moment like meeting on the Eiffel Tower flippantly. I should I should digress. I actually did have a relationship with someone who I met on the Eiffel Tower for five minutes. By the way, I had Ooh, a six year nice. relationship, so <laughs> I had that special feeling of connection when those things happen. So, to me, that's what you're what you're talking about is resonates so much with me, and it's very impressive. And the reality is, it was a watershed moment. I mean. The likes of Virat Kohli, he did very well a few years ago and has done well for some time. And he has set this up, you would have to argue. But the crescendo with so many players out, he himself home with his wife who's expecting, the number of injuries, the, the, the Australians virtually at full strength. There was no, on the ground that they haven't lost for 32, 33 years. It was a, it was theatre waiting to happen. I'm, I'm waiting for a Bollywood style movie to come out because it will deserve it. It should be as you know, grandstanding as possible. But that moment shouldn't have happened. I, I'm not bragging, but I actually predicted they would win. All the way along, people were having a good old go at me, saying, what are you talking about? Either I had the likes of um, Deep Descultor, an ex-player for India, and Pragyan Orja, and my Borea, Borea Majuna was a lot more neutral, but they both said to me, oh, look, that's not going to happen. Normally, you know, Australia's going to fight back. We all know that. And, well, that's what we expected. But it, And they did fight, but India fought harder. And, it, and there's a lot of discussion about um, Australia playing not well and Tim Payne not captaining well and this not going well and the, the coach now being under question. The reality is Australia played well. India it played very played well. better. But India just played better. And that's that's the significance of this with a team that shouldn't have played better. 
that no one expected to play better. They actually did it. And having a, a fellow like Mohamed Siraj bowling and having no reason to even be there playing in that team, leading the bowling attack, getting five wickets, his father passing away, him going home and going to his home to experience that post-event. Remarkable. It's it's really a sort... I mean, you should be getting your American connections onto this pretty damn quickly and, and securing something because it's. I think it's going to be a mega story. Well, it does, it's not going to be. It, it is a mega story. It is quite incredible. We have a few people that have made comments which... Um, Obviously, it comes rather cheeky ones like B comes before C. What they're referring to is baseball before cricket. But that's an interesting one. Of course, America is mad about baseball. But I think the cricket underbelly, as you're describing, underbelly around the world is there. And I'm going to get you, Pretty. One of your tasks for me is to go out the streets and meet people and just see what they have to say. And that will be monumental. Because these audiences that we have listening here today and beyond on, on record love that. I, as I think you may have seen, I walked the streets of Coogee, my beloved Coogee near here, mm -hmm. and I had some of the best reactions from people that I've ever heard. And they were not made up. They were not structured mm -hmm. or rehearsed. They were genuine comments. And they came running to me to tell me how they felt about India. And honestly, I didn't expect that. I didn't know yeah, what to Yeah, I mean, it was very touching to see... Uh, Aussies uh, who had such a positive view uh, about India, in Indian culture, Indian team, the players, it was genuine. And I, I just thought it was beautiful, um, you know, with so much going on in the world, you know, such a divided world and this, there's so much. And I mean, here in the U.S., it's, it's uh, you know, the, this, this racism and the BLM, all of these protests and all, all of that jazz. And then here, yet you see these amazing people who are in awe of this team, and some of them are rooting for India. And I just thought that was beautiful. I think Americans also don't realize that baseball, in in some way, is modeled uh, over cricket, and uh, because the terminology is the same, some of the rules are similar. It's it's a it's the closest thing, and but they don't realize that. I think it was inspired from cricket. I really have to get the real. Or story of the origins of baseball, but that, there is a cricket connection there. And if they knew what a spectacular game cricket is, they would go crazy because baseball, I'm sure I've been to baseball games. It's fine. But I mean, cricket is like next level, right? So if they like baseball, they will go gaga over cricket. Um, but I do think that cricket is going to always be a, like a Commonwealth sport. It's very English in that way. And there's just something about it that I think it caters to, whether it's English, Aussie, Indian, whatnot, um, you know, rather than you think about baseball or, or the American football, that I just think the tone and the tenor of those games are, is very different. But I, very I would true. like to see more Americans get into it. And I don't know if you know this, but this famous actor, Mark Wahlberg, of he course. loves cricket. Not, not only does he love cricket, he, I believe he's a part of a team in Barbados right? He has a cricket, uh, either he owns it or he plays with them or whatnot. I didn't know that. This is a Jewish guy from Hollywood who is crazy about cricket. And I think if we had, you know, ambassadors like that who are into cricket, it would be something else. Well, you have got, you've got Russell Crowe, of course. You've got Hugh Jackman, yes. who are both cricket mad. In fact, Hugh Jackman is a particularly good cricket player. So he's actually, he's very physically fit, we all know that, but he's an incredible player. The, you mentioned Mark Wahlberg. He's actually, if I'm not wrong, I think he's actually in Sydney right now. I think he's near oh. Byron Bay, somewhere uh, southern Queensland. They're actually doing a uh, Elvis biop. There's like a film going on. And the, the reality Wonderful. is he's actually, he's actually, um, in, I believe he's in Australia now. Or he certainly has been here recently. So look, there's a, we can really, you could be the official ambassador for, America. Let's start with the West Coast and work east. And there's and I have a lot of very good contacts in America that are very much into cricket. I have a lot of contacts with the West Indies in particular, and they're only a short distance from the South Coast. I'm actually there's a show that, um, as I said, was meant to be on last night with Mervyn Richards. Now Mervyn Richards, I'm not sure who you know who he is. Oh, of course, he's, he's class a legend. Of yeah. Well, his his brother was certainly a legend, and, and the whole family is amazing. And, 
and I, I could easily get you involved with that because that would be special because you, you're, you're you know, within reasonable proximity. In, we can, well, in one the of the few future. places that I, I, I haven't explored the Caribbean much other than Aruba and Belize and, and so on. And I've been dying to go to Jamaica and I guess Trini and all of those places. So next time they have a tournament, let me know. Or if they want to do a segment, I'd love to interview them. Oh my God, I can, because I love the Caribbean. I, I love island life and the Rasta and everything. It's so amazing. All right, well, what I'm gonna do is gonna get you to come on the next show because I've got, a, I've got a story to tell about how my whole involvement with Western is panned out. It's, it's quite a story. It's, it's almost hard to believe. I even find it hard to believe because there's so many things happened to me that were so incredible. And there's a fellow called Shipwreck. Now remember that name, Pretty, this na man called Shipwreck. Nice Very name. Very unlikely name. He is going to become a superstar through me exposing what he's all about because he is the quintessential know everybody without bragging about a type of character. Wow. On the island of Antigua, which is connected to Barbuda, Antigua, and that's you're talking about Jamaica, you mentioned Trinidad, you mentioned, where else did you mention? You mentioned other places? Aruba. Aruba. I, I haven't but been I don't Aruba, think they're cricket there. I probably don't. That's more of a South American mix of the Caribbean, I think. But, um, yeah, look, I have been to a lot of those places, and, and in particular, my favourite by 100 miles is Antigua. Antigua, Antigua, Antigua. Okay. A beach called Jolly, Jolly Beach. Okay, I'm having visions now. You told me future. about that. We're I, I just said it's the most beautiful beach in the world. I must... Uh... Uh, must go there for sure. I love Google beaches. Google Jolly Beach in Antigua, and I'll show you some photos. I'll send for. Oh my heavens! It's the most amazing place. <laughs> anyway, that particular that particular island has Sir Vivian Richards, Curtly Ambrose, Andy Roberts, wow. Richie Richardson, um, Merv Richards, Viv's brother, um, Ridley Jacob, David Joseph. So these are all famous cricketers. Um, also, a guy called Gravy. Now, Gravy is a an iconic fan who would even get dressed up in a women's wedding gown, wedding outfit and get married in the middle of the field, these crazy antics and the most incredible theatre. He's only a slightly built small man with a little stand in Antigua, but he has this larger than life persona when he gets on the ground. So there's a history there. Of, and that You went to Jolly Beach, Antigua. That's the place that, that beach, the sand there is velvet. The, the water is wow. even more velvety, velvety, whatever word you want to say. And the reality is it's just that particular location is the most, that's my little sanctuary. Are they, are they having a tournament there this year? Well, the West Indies has been a bit thin on tournaments as the rest of the world has. Well, we'll I'll let you know more about it as we go along. I think there's something we'll certainly, okay, there's some characters out there wanting to, wanting to turn us turn over to watch Elon Musk do it, doing a documentary. It's obviously a joke. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, the, the reality is that there's so much that we can talk about. And I really want to engage America because of the fact that the second biggest audience. So there's a there's a lack of connect there that we don't set. Well, yeah. there's certainly tournaments there, but I want to bring them into play because they must be craving watching the, the big boys play, so to speak, because they don't have that many go there. But I know Florida certainly does. But, but New York, there's a long history. In fact, we might do a bit of history discussion of where on earth cricket has gone mm. and ha what happened and why did baseball become the sport why didn't cricket earlier on? It intrigues me a little bit because you would have thought that it would have filtered its way in there earlier than it has. All right. So the other aspect, of your, your, your public speaking that you do a lot of, and I've seen a lot of evidence of that, around spirituality. To me, cricketers have an innate form of spirituality, I would argue, especially leaders of a team or the, the pajaras and his ability to fight off ball after ball and the concentrate for hours that takes a certain presence doesn't it it's presence. Actually... present moment you're in the moment you have to within any sport but especially when you've got a crazy uh, uh you know fast bowler coming at you at the whatever 150 kilometers an hour or whatnot uh you have to be present and um uh, sort of uh, you know it's like a dance right you you dance with the with the force and so on and I mean, you, my favorite player is MS Dhoni. And I look at him and he's Captain Cool, calm, composed. But he's like a guru, you know, he's just completely detached, Zen master. I think he's genuinely detached with the result. So he can just be himself 
and 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 he's the the freedom is there and he's always been like that and it's just a beauty to watch someone like him play and he is magical and he's some of his shots are amazing and all these um match winning performances that he's had so many of some iconic I, some are etched in every indian's heart forever including the world cup uh you just don't um you know you 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 just have to it's there's something almost otherworldly you know when you look at those those shots um or those last overs how they were played by someone like dhoni and you think this is like a, a script to a movie that it's just too good to be true and it's unfolding in front of us uh, i mean not every player is like that but but i get that from dhoni a lot he's quite an inspiration to watch well i'll give you an example um at the sydney cricket ground i was there with one day with this fellow debash sent who i mentioned who who's in charge of extra time he's a very good friend of mine we were both standing there and he knows dhoni better than me and for some bizarre reason i brought my mother along who could barely walk at that time i don't know why i just felt so, that she was lonely i brought her into the ground i sat her down while i was going about my cricket media stuff and she was sitting there in a mining room business and my friend debash just saw that and he thought what could he do so he's got ms stony who was out there batting in the nets he's calling him over ms he had a word in his ear ms stony jumped every fence walked straight to the mother sat next to her and mama had no idea who he was let's be honest and sat there and they met and they and and I was taking a photograph of the two together and I cheekily was taking a video not a photograph so I was taking my time and I was and Emma Stoney had all the time in the world for my mother he was engaged with her held her hand my mother then began to grab him a bit harder than just she was taking it but I was quite <laughs> worried I'm not sure where it was heading I certainly didn't want to have a you know, you know a new father on my hands. I'm joking. The thing is, that my mother was quite you know feeling romantic at that moment. She she was brilliant. It was a magnificent moment. But he had the the, the wherewithal and the, the presence to see that seize that moment and sat there. That video, the bastards made certain of it behind my back. That went absolutely viral. It had millions of hits in in, in India. And you see this great video of my mother and uh, and and Mr. Sonny holding hands. So it's incredible how you brought that man up. For him to do that and be so personable when he didn't need to be, it was quite special. And I've had a similar experience with Tendulkar as well. He's equally the same, and he's an amazing man. When you get him in a situation where he's relaxed, which is pretty hard with all the people around him, he is just such a talks about his wife endlessly, endlessly. That's very. If, if you want to talk about his quickly, you want to talk about his wife's achievements. It was beautiful to see. So I know exactly what you're saying, and I have that personal feeling about. the presence of an Emma Stoney the same with um the likes of Tendulkar and you know what there's a third person that comes to mind immediately is Vera Kohli Vera Kohli looks the aggressor and the strength character not arrogant but you know very very confident but he also spends time when a young boy needs a sign I've witnessed it many of the players they walk straight past the child not that it's bad it's just not in their mindset he turns around goes back signs hugs holds photographs with the, anyone in that group and then takes his time to go back and that's the qualities i have i mean rahana is another one but emma stony tendulkar and kohli share that one trait that you're describing and i think that's why they are as good as they are they're in the moment they don't forget people they're in the moment they know how to handle that and all three and they don't take things. themselves too too seriously they understand that it's all maya anyway you know and there i think some not just in cricket but in other sports and just in life people take themselves too seriously they think they're hot hot stuff and it's just uh, you know they have this sort of facade uh, about themselves really about their place in the world i mean in the big scheme of things we are nothing we are no- nobodies right we are like a speck in the in the sand and i think if you look at it from that way and just have gratitude um for 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 life itself then you 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 get detached from your image because a lot of these stars there's an image there's a public persona and then there's a private persona too i think with the great leaders the with like someone like dhoni the there is no difference between the his public and his private they are one they're they're meshed so you see the private dhoni up out there playing and on the screen whereas i think with a lot of other people maybe up and coming uh they are trying to um find themselves i guess and especially when fame happens and you 
and you haven't you're not there yet spiritually it's tricky because it's uh, you your your spiritual sort of um you know uh development is hap is unfolding in front of the world and sometimes it ain't pretty as we've seen you know people's the shadow side comes up and, and there's a lot of drama and all of that but um it's it you know and i just i'm so proud and happy to see this team they're you know they're polite they're courteous they uh, also with covid they understand what's going on around the world they're, they're very mindful they you know they're not thinking that uh, that they're you know privileged in, i mean they are privileged in that way but uh, i think it puts things into perspective and you can see that the way they talk and so on there is just sort of a, a humane quality that i saw to be honest with with all teams and maybe corona has done that for us it's made us very real and uh, we given given up given us a, a great kick in the backside about what's really important absolutely absolutely i was looking at some of the comments the the, the the this 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 hour i'll make it clear to the audience as well i normally talk in detail about cricket the the finer points about a game and the not necessarily statistics, but more about that. But I think we've got to bring the yin and yang of cricket. It's not just simply about how many runs are played. It's, it's what presence they bring to a team. The way that we're discussing an MS Stoney or a or, or, or Kohli or a Tendulkar or even Rahani more recently and a Siraj, those personal traits behind the scenes are equally as important as their skill because their skill means nothing if they're not mentally fit or metaphysically there it's one of those situations that you can't go away from and you look at the australian team now the australian team i'm not about to bash them in terms of what they've done they've obviously lost and they they get that they've had a lot of people centering on certain players do they need to be there does the coach it's an atypical situation to knock the coach and captain when the team loses it's very normal we don't like that losing and we tend to look for those scapegoats but i think australia's handled it pretty well they've, they've they've looked introspectively and there's a term that was brought out called a a a form of honesty it was a like a brutal honesty in fact there's a word for it they, they used it today and i i just i've just forgotten it at this moment but it's a word that certainly is um it's around that a certain looking at like it's like the words they look a form of honesty where you look at your own self I'm it, looking into a mirror. Yeah, but there's a certain word that that's been coined, and I'll I have to pull it up because it's very interesting. I thought Justin Langer's uh, he gave a that, little talk that exactly. was beautiful. He very uh, sincere from the heart and beautiful, you know. And I I just thought the Australian team was very very gracious. They played beautifully. They must they be did. you know proud of um, uh, the efforts. I mean, some of the bowlers were spectacular. There were oh, some absolutely. Real, standouts you know they, they also have a lot to be proud of i just think this was a magical series it was it wasn't about skill it wasn't about how good a team was i think there was something bigger here happening Absolutely. it was about courage okay yes. it's the, the term is that they used here is a form of elite honesty huh? and it's, it's that's the term that's been used and it's it's what we call justin langer the coach of australia he's elite honesty mantra and he said lead from the front do what i yeah. do what i do rather than what i say and he's he's got a very strong almost military like aspect to his performance which is good when you're going well but when certain cracks occur people look at that in an introversion and they look at that and say well is that the right way are you too hard are you too this are you too that and that's the issue that they've got now justin lang has been questioned or he should be questioning himself and having a look at a mirror on his, his own self which is very hard because justin langer played hard as nails and he was very successful so no but it's it's amazing and it is a watershed moment i mean i've watched cricket all my life and i've seen all sorts of moments which are dramatic and um the moments when australia's come out of the out of the woods to win against the west indies and and moments when we shouldn't have won which we did and india's done the same thing now it it don't you it's it's i think and i mentioned it to one of the children that i interviewed he was only 12 i said when you have when you have your grandchildren you'll yeah. see what they say and he, he got that and his father laughed but he, the kid got it so it's it is a pretty important moment he mentioned washington sunder as his favorite player so yeah oh no look, this is great so I, I think our audience will appreciate i've been getting comments like why are we talking more about cricket well we certainly are talking about we're talking about probably one of the most fundamental parts of cricket yeah. and that's up here you can be the best player in the world but if you fall apart up here you'll have a series of results that are not going to go your way the one of the biggest things about sport and, and cricket certainly one of them is 
the interactions of players, the, yes. they, the, the ability to get along is so important. It is such an important facet of a team. Yeah, we have seen uh, teams break, fall apart, including Indian team. Uh, they've had, uh, you know, there have been some uh, certain uh, uh, kind of uh, uh, periods where there wasn't that camaraderie. And of course, that famous, the, you know, when we had specific coaches taking over and there was the, it was a divided dressing room and uh, uh, not healthy for the morale. And they weren't, they, did, they lost a few games to it that added to, to everything, but um, we have seen this, I think, in every country. They've had, uh, you know, times when, you know, you, you just a divided de dressing room and or the, the the captain isn't getting along with the, the, the star player and, and vice versa and so on. And that's always uh, tricky. And we've seen it. And test is different because you have a series of games. You've got it over several days. You really are uh, have to work with, uh, you know, uh, your teammates. You can't not... T20 is different. You can come do your thing and leave. But uh, test is very different. World Cup is very different. So there is such a thing as team team spirit. I think this um, particular test series, it was teamwork that won it, right? It was the team that won it. It wasn't one, one person. No. They all, um, you know, uh, they all played a part, all of them. Uh, and it's Absolutely. beautiful to watch. And we're, we're forgetting the obvious, too. You've just talked about the pandemic in America and the ability to lock down. Well, even though we've had a pretty good situation here in Australia, the teams were in those so-called biosecurity bubbles. Bubble. Yeah, They weren't interacting with anyone. And the few times they did, it would make front page news that they may have gone here. Like the classic, I interviewed um, the owner of Baby Village, which was a shop where both Coley and Pandia when it went into when they finished the tour and they were they were magnificently received at that place. They paid for the goods they bought way beyond what they needed to buy. The owners were trying to throw the goods at them. They said, no, we're going to pay for this. It was a warm feeling experiencing that. Yet the papers kind of tore away and said, oh, COVID breach drama and turned it into a, a bit of a debacle when it, when it wasn't. And I went and interviewed the owner and he was magnificent. So, and it hit the papers all throughout India and it was just all about the good side of it really. So, and it being cooped up in a, in a hotel, unable to leave as, a, as an athlete must be mind-blowingly hard. No, and also you need you need practice time. You need to warm up. You need your uh, body needs to keep going. Uh, I mean, the, the, uh, the Australian Open is going on. These uh, players are having a, a hell of a time and they're very, very upset. They're not even able to practice. And this is going to be a very strange Australian Open. I think uh, the, the cricket... Um, players at least had they were able to uh, practice uh, you know that's true so they got, we, we, you need to be able to practice especially the balling and, and actually batting too uh, or else you're that's just not going to work you have to have some kind of you, you need to be warmed up and ready to go because this is, this is a huge match and huge result at stake i mean we this is the test the world champion um, part of that right so it all counts I think this is going to be one hell of a uh, a final in, in the end uh, when it happens in June, and That's I think true. there's a lot of great cricket to be played. There will be more uh, amazing stories. I have no doubt about it. We're seeing, you know, stories coming from other parts of the world, uh, also spectacular stories. But this whole test as a, a unit, as an uh, as an event, I guess, is um, very very hard to um, uh, repeat. I think how incredible it was and what it meant to the people, especially after uh, almost a year of no cricket, right? Oh, I think yeah. uh, it was great for India. I think great. It really brought the country together, which is great. Well, this week uh, on Friday, uh, sorry, the, four, the fifth, in fact, um, we have India playing England, which is another chapter of all this. And, of course, as, as we at the day before, Pakistan are playing South Africa in Pakistan, which has not happened for years as well. So I think it's the second match now to play the official test. I think of sure it's the second I think test. they're very brave to go there, to be honest, to, uh, to, uh, after what happened to the Sri Lankan team many years ago. That's right? true. I'm, I think the South African team is very brave. But it's, but it's the strength of character with COVID, with, with what happened there in Pakistan, which happened in so many other places, incidents in England going back when they had the multiple bombings. That was during a summer period where sure. Craig was being played there as well. I was there then. I can never forget that. We were scared to go on a bus 
uh, it was completely random. It could have been a person with a backpack. It could have been any nationality. It was really, I, and I've been, as I said, I've been to Sri Lanka more than more than 20 years now. And having been married to a lovely lady from Sri Lanka and spending time there and bombings were rife throughout wow. the whole country. I yeah. mean, it was, it, was, yeah. it was, it was a complete civil war going on and you never knew when it was going to happen. It was, could have been a, a little old lady. It could have been a, a pregnant woman. It could have been an old man. It was, it was no uh, prejudice as to whom was performing the bombing. It was quite scary. So, yeah, the world is a place that we'd rather not have all these things happen. But cricket, as you said, is a level. And I, and I think that's a great point. Pretty, I, I'm really excited about this connection. You, you, you've brought a lot to not only this show but to the, the whole channel. Um, I'm going to get you involved with various sessions coming up, if you're available, of course, and the time differences and what have you, I'll let you know about that. But I mean, we're going to be broadcasting for each day, every day of the first test match starting next um, mm -hmm. Friday. And then we're, all sorts of other events are going to happen as well. I've got a whole host of people, Monty Panasas, as long as he's available, because he, they're all tearing him, they're pulling him from arm each end. I'll get, in fact, and only a matter of what, an hour or so, Adam Holyoke's coming on to talk to me. And Adam's a special friend of mine. He obviously had the tragic um, passing of his brother, which is a story some years ago. Uh, he's, he talks about that. It's just an amazing story. But a great man. Um, Simon Willis is a very, very important coach, having coached the England outfit and the Sri Lankan outfits. Chris Vernon, who's a very good player, he's experienced more of the, yes. the, uh, the Lords and MCC and he's been involved in all that. But yeah, I've got some great people. And not to, not to mention Mervyn Hughes, Richard, sorry, not Hughes, Mervyn Richards. The West Indian group. players are so cool, right? They are, there's nobody cooler. They're such cool cats. Even their commentators, I love watching, you know, the, the these uh, sports shows where they do the commentary. It's just so cool. <laughs> and they have a way of, they're, they're very eloquent, they're very articulate, yes. they're very insightful, and they've got time. Very passionate too, yeah. I'll have to, and I'll have I didn't to... realize they love cricket. I mean, you know, Indians are pretty obsessed, but but West Indians, Caribbeans are also very obsessed. They even have the cricket, um, the wickets on their flag, right? And their symbols, emblems, and things like that. I just think it's beautiful. Well, I'll give you an example. There's an island called Dominica. There's yes, Dominican I've heard Dominican a lot Republic. about that. I've been wanting to go there. Dominique is right. It's very much, it's very British, it's very cricket related. So you can go there and play cricket. Mountainous, somewhat not necessarily poor, but it has its struggles depending on how the um, travel industry goes, which of course now it's not. But it's surrounded by two countries or two islands uh, Guadalupe and mm -hmm. Martinique, which are totally and utterly French. Yes. French to the hilt. They've got French cars. They've got French sure. signposts. They've got French toilets. Everything's French. They speak French. So cricket's like a billion miles apart. But you, you go from one island by a, an Australian hydrofoil, I'll tell you, and you go past to Dominica. But you can go straight past. These two islands haven't got a clue about cricket. But Dominica is a cricket haven. And that's the most bizarre thing that you can see. But it's intriguing at the same time. So we'll explore all that. Certainly, we'll get that at in here we've got a lot to talk about a lot, lot of future endeavors uh, yes. in particular the Mervyn Richards series will start and it'll, you have no idea where that's going to head he is just a magical man I call him the Pope because he kisses so many girls hands it's kind of Pope -like. but he I can I walked down the main street of Antigua he'll kiss every woman's hand they all know him and I'm going I'm Mervyn it's okay but are we ever going to get to the end of the street here are we is there any, <laughs> no I've got to do my duty to every single one of them and it's just He's genuine. He's the most genuine man I've ever met. Tremendous guy. Very much. The whole family is quite frankly. Uh, just quickly, Viv Richards. You, you could be sitting next to Viv Richards. You know, he's an amazing person, right? Someone might want to have his attention about maybe 50 metres, 100 metres away. He has the presence of mind to turn to you and say, Norman, you must excuse me. I've just got to leave now. That gentleman over there is asking to talk to me. He bothers to say all that. You, you I know. love it. Such a classy gentleman and... Again, uh, very humane, very real, uh, not taking yourself too seriously, not thinking you're you're the most important thing in the world. I mean, it's those kind of uh, celebrities or stars that, that people love. And people see it. You know, there's a difference when you're trying to impress and when you know who you are and you're actually just being yourself and comfortable in your own skin. I think it... it um, 
it ripples far uh, across and people really uh, see the difference, you know, and... Uh, well, most of the greats. The, sorry, yes, most all of the, great, the greats, almost all of them had that amazing Arjuna, Arjuna Rana Sunga is yes. the quintessential man like that. Um, the Sangha Karas, the Jayawanas, all have got this ability. Viv Richards in spades, Tendulkar, Kohli, they all have this MS Dhoni without a shadow of a doubt. They are, they have a presence. And I'm, I'm very good friends with the likes of Doug Walls and Jeff Thompson who have been on the show. Legends coming out of their ears. They don't, they don't think that of themselves. Doug will offer you a beer. Sit down, we'll have a beer together. He just is so down to worth. Jeff Thompson's phone has a Rolodex of everybody that's famous. Mick Jagger, Paul McCartney, um, uh, Sir Richard Branson, blah, blah, blah. He has a list of about 40 people. They ring him. He doesn't ring them. And he doesn't understand why they're ringing him. <clears throat> it's amazing. <clears throat> All right. Pretty, I'm going to leave it there. We've gone a bit under an hour, but that's perfect. Um, I, I'm, it's not a matter of time. I know that you and I could talk for the next four hours. But where we but have it's to for talk. the audience and their, their uh, oh. attention, and, and we gotta give, we've got to given them something hot and spicy, I think. <laughs> uh, trust me, what we've, we've talked about, I found, I found it extremely interesting hearing what you had to say, so I can just imagine they will as well. So thank you for your time. So I'm going to connect with you about other, other such things. I mentioned to it, we'll, we'll interact regarding that, but you're a breath of fresh air. You're wonderful. I'm very, very happy to have you a part of this. I hope you are too. Oh, thank you, Norman. Again, namaste. And uh, thank you to your uh, audience for tuning in. And I just can't wait to be part of your, uh, your show again. Love to uh, be back and uh, chat with, uh, you know, whoever. I think it's going to be great. Uh, thank you again for having me. It's a joy to speak about one of the things I'm so passionate about. Thank you again. Uh, for all of our viewers, it's Norman Koshnak here. I'm signing off from Eyes on Cricket with Norman Koshnak. You know what to do. View, like, and share where the subscribe button is. Subscribing means a lot to me because we can grow the channel. Share it with your friends. You know the story. What's that? Tell you, your colleagues, your, your companions, your friends. Let them know about it because if you've enjoyed it, they hopefully will as well. So thank you very much. All the best. Talk to you very soon again, guys.